Okay. Time to catch up. Hi, everybody. Oh, all right. We'll do the usual. Let people catch up. Get in here. Uh, let's see. What can I talk about before I get on topic? Uh, chat's already like going hog wild, which is great. Or you got talk people talking about their dream tank, or or uh, how some people have basically always only had one tank. Let's see. What can I talk about? Uh, so I finally just got out of a really big delivery at work. It's basically been like a a month of. <laughs> a month of stress and, and overtime. <laughs> um, but with that being said, so like I had to catch up on email and I was easily a month behind on email. Just because of between work and some other commitments, I've been crazy busy. So I spent, no joke, four hours yesterday doing email. Just email for my uh, Bentley.Pasco at gmail.com. So the one I use for fish, right? And I still did not catch all the way up. <laughs> so if I didn't get back to you yet, there's only like four of you that uh, I have to get back to. And uh, man, <laughs> I'm hoping I'll have that done either like tonight or tomorrow. It kind of depends. There's a few final work things I probably have to tend to uh, tonight after stream, but Today or tomorrow, you'll have your response. And then, um, for the, for those of you who were like responded right away, I am trying to get back to you guys uh, quickly as well. Just because I, I want to get caught up, I want to get people helped who've been very patient. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for your patience. I really, really appreciate it. I don't know. For some people, they're like, "Hey, at least you answer." Some YouTubers don't even answer. I, I, usually, I try to not be that far behind. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, I would. I spent four hours dedicated just to answering email. It was kind of wild, and and I looked at myself and I'm like, man, I cannot let myself get this far behind again. <laughs> but you know, you've got things like uh, people uh, asking for help through in-depth solutions, and and those emails are long. And it's a lot of data, and I need to like, I need to really think about some of those things and, and make sure that my response is not uh, fast and offhanded. It it needs to be informed and really help those kind of people. And there's there's also the questions that. Um, have some complexity to them too. So yeah, yeah. And uh, they actually one of those emails spawned tonight's stream. So Desert Fish Keeper, who's in chat, good to have you here. Of course, uh, you know we've talked a few times, but uh, Desert Fish Keeper was one of the people who commented about having a a singular system in last week's stream, and, and we'll kind of reel into our our topic here. Uh, and mentioned they have this like super nice water box and I uh, got pictures. It's beautiful. I, I probably should have like been a more prepared streamer and like kept them and showed them because <laughs> they're kind of inspiration for the stream. But because of certain conditions in, in where Desert Fish Keeper is living, can only have one tank. And I, you know, I thought to myself, what would it be like if I could only have one tank? If something changed... Uh, in, in my, my living situation or my, my life, whatever that may be, and all of a sudden, I can't keep a bunch of fish tanks all over the place. I only get one tank. How am I going to, like, break the system so I get the most bang for my, my proverbial buck, if you will? And, and two, what the heck am I going to keep in that thing? Because you got to think about it this way, right? If I have one tank, I can't keep rainbows and the guppies at the same time because the rainbows would eat the guppy babies and the guppies would never be able to kind of get a colony going so all of a sudden I'm, I'm in this predicament where two of my favorite fish that I keep I could not keep together and do what I want them to do Right? They keep lots of rainbows together. You could do some really insane rainbow tank. But you got to think about, like, how... How would I approach that tank? Would I go really big? Would I try to keep it slightly smaller so it's easy to do maintenance on? 
uh, one of these things. So Sandy Cheeks immediately asks, and this is like, you're just, you're perfect. You're directing me right where I need to go. Is there a budget and tank size? Okay. So I would say that depends on you. Now me, I am very fortunate. I'm in a fairly good paying career. Now granted, I'm the only income in my home, right? So I don't have a ton of spare money, but I'm relatively good with my money. So I usually have my, my play funds. And in this case, I would probably give myself something like five or six thousand dollars just for my tank and i know some people are gonna go like what but if i'm forced to only have one tank because i keep so many fish and i love so many things i am not doing this lightly this is not going to be like a 40 breeder we're going big we're going bad we're going mean so bare minimum for me would have to be something like a 240 gallon and ideally if i could budget it correctly and i would say i would take my time and i would save because i'm that kind of person i would look at doing a 480 custom built so that's eight foot by four foot big boy big boy with a sump so that's even more gallonage right we're not going to play this light i actually have a sump that would go for that kind of tank in my driveway right now <laughs> this is my buddy darren made me like the most insane deal no demand on this beautiful sump and i've got a plan for it it's going to go in a pretty cool system eventually now <laughs> ball soltero discus is the answer now what is the question oh sir not with me come on we know better now this would be this would be difficult but in the end, I would probably have to say I don't get to keep my guppies anymore. Which would make me very sad. I want to be very clear. I love those guppies. But I love rainbow fish more. So the question becomes, let's talk. We've got equipment in mind, right? We're going we're gonna to go all out. So we're talking a sump, a 480-gallon tank, That means that we can hide all our equipment down there. Heaters. I'm putting a, an auto doser in this thing. CO2, most definitely. We're going to build a full out CO2 reactor. That way we get the absolute best distribution of CO2 gas into the water that we possibly can. And inside a sump, that's easier to do. We're going to put lots of outgoing flow, right? So that we have plenty of, of movement and, and lots of flow. But here's where this is, gets interesting. When it comes to what the tank's design is in the planting, I'm going to go low maintenance. Right? And make sure you have a check valve on that sump. <laughs> well, you, you'd set it up correctly, right? This, is, this, this would be one of those things where I would just go, how much does this cost? Okay, I will save. I will wait. I will be patient. Or especially if it was like I've had to sell off all my stuff that I have now and I have to pare it all the way down. That's how it's going, right? I am I am selling stuff off. I'm using that money. I'm doing things. You have to keep in mind, like, I have a large chunk of money for, for what most people would consider a large chunk of money. I'm sure there are some people out there who'd be like, that is a pittance, you peasant. But <laughs> what is a large chunk of money set aside to do my garage fish room? And this would literally just... You think about translating a large chunk of money enough to build a small fish room into one singular tank because that's what we would be talking about here in the end it's a big chunk of money right so we got that plants simple you guys have seen the plants that i love the most while i've done all sorts of crazy stuff i've done really high demand plants all that stuff those were done specifically for Growing out plants, challenging myself. When it comes to a tank that is that size, I want to go low maintenance, despite the fact that I'm using CO2. So now we're talking Java Fern, Crips, and because it's a personal favorite, I'm going to have quite a lot of Nymphaea in there. 
Nymphaea is going to be one of my things that is in one of my maintenance regions. Something that I will... Act, the few things that I'll actively maintain. Not going a lot of stems. Might have a sword or two or something like a Madagascar lace. Maybe uh, a Panagetans. Because they're... Once you... You just... They're kind of a set it and forget it. Right? But... Quite a lot of boosts. Can have uh, boosts as our shaded plants or some Anubiuses. Stuff like that. We can design this with some cool... Using wood and rock. Make it nice. But not heavily aquascaped. We want lots of room for swim space because we're going to have rainbows. I have to have rainbows, right? I mean, this is... We're talking me. It's got to be rainbow fish. But this becomes a real question. We have a 480-gallon tank. We have an opportunity to see something you don't see very commonly in the hobby... In a tank, which is a big school of one species of rainbow. Or, we could have a ton of different rainbows and just have this massive mixture of color flying all over the place. There's just color everywhere you look. Every color you can think of. Every type of rainbow you can think of. Just go hog wild. Now, for me, I'm probably only going to choose two species. Now, that doesn't include maintenance fish and things like that, right? This is just the rainbows. The, the rainbows are the centerpiece. One Melanotania. One Chalatharina. Or one Glossolepis. I have to choose. It's very, it's very hard choice. Now, for me, I love... The Glossolepis Wanamensis a lot. But if I'm having mostly green plants, they're not going to stand out quite as much. So we're not going to go that route. I'm, I'm curious. From those who've watched for a while, I, I want to see chat tell me because I'm going to tell you two things. I'm going to make this easy. It ain't Kali Tawa. It ain't Cali Tawa, Stephen P. The rainbow that got me into this hobby was the Bozeman Eye. But the crown jewel of my fish room, I have said this many, many times, is the Running River. So what I want to see from you guys, I want to see this part, is what of those two, which do you think I'm keeping in there? Running River, Bozeman Eye. As my Melanotania. I'll tell you the other one. Well, that's very simple. There is a ton of color in the fish. But more kind of unique color. And you might initially think that's going to be an Eleni Wapoga, which would be a really good guess. Because I think of all the Chalatharinas, they're probably right now the, the iconic, super beautiful one. We got people, we got people bringing in. I like it, I like it. But for me, the Centani rainbow, the Centaniensis, Chalatharina Centaniensis is the Chalatharina I want. And let me explain why. They're really good schoolers. They school tight. They have beautiful red colors. And those colors shift to kind of from rusty to very vibrant red. See, a lot of people are saying Blaherai, and I know, I love the party animal a lot, but I'm actually going to choose the Centaniensis. I know, crazy, because I love Blaherai. But I want Blaherai solo, because they get very big. Centaniensis doesn't get quite as big. Also, it's a very rare fish that can, in the right conditions, colony spawn and not predate on their young. So when we're looking at a 480 gallon tank, we can potentially get that group to spawn and not predate on their own young. Where Blaherai most certainly will predate on their own young. Because they get quite a bit bigger. And they can get... Aggressive's not the right word, but they're a little more... Go get them, if you will. So that's why I picked Santaniensis. 
All right, so let's see. Almost everybody, very few of you, are on on the the running river train. Very few are on the Bozeman night train. And, it, and now some people are, are making so. So Stephen P is kind of on it. If I'm doing Centaniensis, I probably won't do Bozmanai, and that's correct. The the Bozmani are a bigger fish, unless you get some specific ones. So I would go Running River. That's right. I the fish that got me into Rainbow Fish, I would not keep. I would not keep them. I'd keep Running River, because similar to the Centaniensis, Running River school very tightly. Right? It's school very, very tightly. And I, I have really, really, really fallen in love with my group since I moved them to the 40-gallon. Because now that I see their full color and they're interacting with plants, and I get to see some of their behavior as, a, as the solo fish. I mean, there's some maintenance crew in there, but they're incredible. They're just incredible. They're an incredible fish. Let's see if I've got the... I think I have the picture sitting over here for Running River. I might not. One minute. One minute. Because there was a there was a question about what what they look like, and I I want to show you if I have that picture handy dandy, but I might not. Have I have I snuck this thing away? Ugh, I have failed at life. I don't have my running river picture snuck away. <laughs> Okay. It'll take me too much work. I want to do that. Now, if I were doing single species, here's the difference. If I if I decided single species, then I would actually go Bozmanai. And the reason here is there are, there are two color fish, and they're what got me into rainbows. And I just would have to have, if I was doing one and only one species, have that fish. So I'm kind of cheating. I'm kind of setting up two different options. But realistically, the more that I watch my, my, gr my group of Centaniensis and my running rivers, I love, for a, a, a bigger fish, right, I love how tightly they school. And because they're actually smaller than some of the other ra the big rainbows out there, you can keep more of them, or more importantly, in that big tank, you would probably see them school separately a lot more. And that's what I'm going for. I want to see the Chalatharina stay together and the Melanotania stay together and see if it's possible to have that happen inside a big enough tank where they live like two different schools instead of one big mixed group. And of course, we'll have cleaning crew. I'm probably going to put Wobbin Moosters in there because I love the Wobbin Mooster. Um, I, I might look at like having some sand and if I did that, something like geophaguses would be great to chill the sand up or maybe just a big group of Corydoras because I do love Corydoras. Of course, I'm going to have Autosynclus. I love Autosynclus. They're, they're the best peaceful fish in the world. And I just have common autos because I love common autos. They're, they're bulletproof. They go great. No love for rads. I love rads in smaller tanks because they're smaller and they live in great groups in a 40. If I'm going to a huge tank, I'm getting something a little bigger that's really going to go hog wild in a group. That's really what it comes down to. Like, am I ever going to be forced to have one tank? No. Thankfully, my significant other loves the fact that I'm a complete psycho when it comes to fish. And is like, yeah, I want you to build your garage fish room. I want you to have even more nonsense than you have now. <laughs> that's, that's a good partner right there. Like, I want you to be even more crazy. <laughs> So, I want to go over some of your guys' because there's been some great stuff in chat. And I I think some of you have some really cool concepts of, like, the dream tank or the if I can only keep one thing. Uh, so, Dusk right away mentioned I've always only had one tank, though I started using the word system once I started using a sub. Which I, I think is fine, but you can still call it a tank. It's fine. I found that focusing on one has continually led me to keep upgrading and improving it rather than chasing MTS. Ah, but multiple tank syndrome can be so fun. <laughs> I totally understand that though. If you got one thing, you're just gonna you're just gonna keep 
making it cooler and more amazing, right? Because you just you have that one thing to appreciate at its maximum, so you're going to keep pushing toward what is the new maximum, right? Even converted it to salt water for around two years just to see how that worked. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. Kingfisher's Catch. Personally, I'd get as long a footprint as possible. River biotope for rainbow, rainbows, Borneo suckers, gobies, and pseudomagills. Maybe Val or Cryptosporalis and high flow. Yeah, especially if you get like stream or river style rainbows, which Running River is one of them. There's a couple of Bozmanai that come from stream systems that are a little bit faster moving. Those are smaller bodied rainbows like uh, Apes Creep, Chromsa, etc. Could be pretty amazing. There's a lot. I mean, there's tons of Chalatharinas and Trifasciatas and stuff that all come from more stream systems that are just amazing fish. Alyssa Bentley, if I could only have one tank, it would have to be my dream tank. I feel like my whole hobby is just me trying to work up to my dream tank. Johnny over at Dance Fish, I do an African oddball planted tank. African butterflies, leaf fish, knives, maybe some blue diamond tetras for midwater activity. That fish, that, that fish tank actually sounds super cool. I think African butterfly fish are one of those fish that I think is really underappreciated. Because they're, they're kind of like a mini arowana in a way. In the sense that they've got that big trapdoor mouth. They they really love that very top water. You don't really see them coming down very much. Uh, and that's that's common for a lot of your arowana. But they're also a lot smaller. They've got that really cool, you know, butterfly look in their in their finnage when you look at them from the top. They're just a unique fish. And I think I would rather have those than hatchet fish. If we were doing some kind of like ultra top water fish. I'd be looking at something more like that. Because it's a it's a cool fish, and it's a it also classifies you in that oddball realm, right? Where hatchets are kind of a common schooler. There's a million billion of them all over the place, but they're still cool. Do 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 do. do. I know there's some questions in here. Don't worry, we'll get to questions. All right, so here's here's Alyssa's dream tank. Six foot, maybe three by three by six, with a colony of 12 L255 Plecos and six Ultim Angels. And then 2,000 green neon tetras. Ooh. Ooh. I like it. Definitely love for the Plecos. Some Ultims. And Ultims get big when, they're, when they've got the space. And they look amazing. But then just a huge school of green neons. And they're probably going to get snacked on, right? Yeah, yeah, you admit they'll get snacked on. <laughs> <laughs> Those altos are probably going to have a, have a very expensive snack. But man, that would be neat. That would be neat. Uh, da, da, da. What else we got for the, the dream tank? The giant one tank that's the only one I'm allowed to have kind of stuff. Throw them in chat if you got your own. I, I want to see them. I want to see what you guys have in mind as well. <laughs> Stephen P. Quarx. <laughs> I have over 10,000 unread emails at Gmail, but it's all notifications and promos and stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty good about flagging all my promo stuff, so it doesn't make me lose the stuff that actually matters. Um, but, yeah, uh, I, I've got so behind. It took me forever to mostly catch up. Uh, Leo, 209 Aquatics, a quick question uh, that I can answer very fast. Uh, what do you think of the three levels of treating with salt on the co-op blog? What's your opinion on that? I haven't read it. That's my answer, so I can't give you an opinion. Uh, my assumption is they're all based on certain concentrations and why you would use those concentrations, and if so, it's probably pretty good information. Uh, more than likely, some of that comes directly from Corey, just because he has some some big experience in using salt as a treatment, uh, just from running a store and working in stores and all that kind of stuff, and the, and the number of tanks he's kept over his time. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm always in a very, like, light therapeutic dose as opposed to heavy because all of my tanks are very heavily planted. I very rarely have a un unplanted tank and even my unplanted tanks tend to end up with a lot of plants in them anyway, some form of plant matter. So going heavy on salt is really hard because that's just going to nuke the plants. Uh, but lighter salt dosages, which I consider like a, a therapeutic dose as opposed to a medicinal dose. So that's something like a tablespoon per 20 gallons and even up to a tablespoon per 10 gallons at times is usually diluted enough to not hurt the plants, but still give you some effect with the fish, as long as you're not dealing with very sensitive fish, like your corridories, etc. <laughs> uh, 
We'll see the new 60 gallon Aquion breeder would be super tempting for a one tank household. Yeah, I think if you're being like more realistic where it's like, yeah, I can I can I can have like a four foot tank on a nice stand and I can be in my living room or or a study or whatever you know room you're going to put it in and not like a, a fish psycho like me. Uh, <laughs> I think that is w way more reasonable. Uh, and I would even argue that you could potentially go to something like a 75 gallon if you have a single tank and you're not trying to do racking systems or anything like that. Uh, it take up a very sim similar footprint, just slightly taller, really. And those are, like, great options, right? For, like, a one slightly bigger but not super big tank for your entire household. And you can do a lot of fun stuff that if you got kids, you can teach kids about stuff with all sorts of different fish in that kind of footprint. You've got a lot of room to do some things in that. <laughs> Jacob Hill, split the tank with a divider. <laughs> now you're trying really hard to cheat. <laughs> Johnny and Dan's fish. If it's one tank, it has to be 180 plus gallons. Of course. We gotta go big. I'm a rainbow fish guy. We go big, man. We go bigger, we go home. <laughs> we're, we're psychos. <laughs> Jeff Kosky. A long tank with a divider with holes big enough for water to go through, but small enough so guppies can't get through and have both guppies and rainbows. I mean, yeah, we're, you guys try to break the rules. <laughs> I appreciate it, though. I, I, as a person whose job is literally to break things for a living, I appreciate the, the, the want to, uh, to break, break the rules. And I'm sure if I was really like gun to my head, like, okay, you only get one tank now. Figure out what fish you're keeping. I'm, I'm breaking rules, and I'm figuring out a way to like, okay, the guppies can live down in the sump, <laughs> and then the rainbows will live up in the big display tank. <laughs> some, some psychotic thing like that, where it's like. Instead of having plants in one of my chambers, I'll just have guppies down there. <laughs> There's your cheater way, right? Use your sump as a guppy tank. <laughs> uh, Jacob Hill, Bentley, you should actually do this tank. So, full disclosure, in my um, in my garage fish room, like early plans, before I have it empty and I can actually start taping things off to like know what things look like, I looked at potentially putting one very large tank in there. And uh, it, it comes down to a couple of things. It's either I have several really nice display tanks, and we're talking like somewhere between four and eight 150 gallon display tanks, or I have one really big tank. Uh, and and in the end, it, for, to me, it was like, well, it seems more enjoyable to have several nice displays and then a bunch of room functionally for doing things like breeding and some more plant specific work and um, kind of like my, my testing lab tanks for doing more YouTube oriented content as opposed to purely just enjoyment in the fish room than it would to take up a ton of space out there with just one enormous tank. Um, and, that, and that's just a matter of, cause then I can feature several fish in singular species style tanks with that made with numbers of displays as opposed to just like okay i got one really big crazy tank and believe me one big crazy tank is kind of a dream but uh, at the same time like 150 gallons is a really nice tank size that's five foot by two foot by two foot it it's really great space for rainbows and several other fish including guppies like i could upgrade to an even nicer guppy mansion basically put where they would get a little more gallonage a little more space and be in a, a beautiful display tank like they kind of are now. And I mean, display is a, it's not hyper aquascape. We're not talking like bring the ADA guys or George Farmer or somebody crazy like that. That's really good at that stuff. It's display for my quality, which is like, let the plants do their things. Let it get nice and healthy and robust. Give it a little bit of CO2, make it pretty, but not make it insane because that's tons of maintenance, right? We, we know that my life, I don't have room for tons of maintenance. I have room for a little bit of maintenance and trying to make it as efficient as possible. Which is where sumps come in, because sumps make a lot of things much faster and easier when it comes to maintenance on your filtration. <laughs> Bentley, <laughs> when you do tank maintenance on that bad boy, you're going for a swim. Kinda, yeah. Kinda, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, if you if you drain it down enough, it's not so bad. But that's why you pick you specifically pick stuff that requires almost no maintenance, and you'll have like one region where you you're doing maintenance, and then you're just kind of like, you know dipping your whole arm into the tank to do some work. <laughs> Alec the Nice, you could hire an aquascaper from ADA Aquarium in Japan. Uh, the thing is, when they when they aquascape those kind of tanks, then they, they take a ton of maintenance. 
So if if I do it my way, it's very low maintenance, and and I'm okay with that. I don't need it to be this amazing aquascape thing. I need it to have nice lush plant growth and lots of swim space for my fish because I like watching my fish swim in plants, and that makes me very very happy. And I can do that on my own. And sometimes, sometimes you take more pride in something when you build it yourself. At least I do. <laughs> if it's if it's mine, I tend to I tend to appreciate it a little bit more than if it's somebody somebody can make me a beautiful piece of art and then tell me, okay, you maintain that piece of art, then I'm gonna be like, well, I don't like maintaining this whole section here, and I'm just gonna start ripping it apart, and it's no longer that beautiful thing they created. It's now this like hodgepodge Frankenstein piece of art that Bentley ruined. <laughs> Bob Purcell, Bentley, will you have a boat for the puppies to sail around in the tank? <laughs> uh, my my lady and I have often joked that if if I ever like you know that eccentric millionaire thing, if I ever won a lotto or whatever and built some like big koi pond, because I totally would if I did, if I had that kind of like funding available. Um, if if we would specifically do stuff so that the dogs could go play with the fish, and my biggest fear is that. One of my dogs might try to uh, catch the fish. I think I think Papa Limo is good enough that he'd probably leave him alone. He'd probably try to figure out how to herd them, but you know he's not as fast a swimmer, so <laughs> I don't know how well that would work. But Shantono, she's a she's a lithe, agile machine. She might try to she might try to chase stuff. All right, uh, and then of course, guys, feel free to put your questions in chat. I'll be I'll be catching up as I get. Caught up in chat here. Just at Bentley Pasco. Put your question. It makes it a lot easier for me to see. If you have a really complex question, don't be afraid to shoot me an email. I've caught up quite a lot. I'll try to be getting to people a little bit faster now that my work's not like in in crazy, oh my goodness, we have to deliver something very, very important very, very soon mode. <laughs> Man, get it giving me such giving me such gruff. Here's the real question. Will the level on the 480 be higher than the level on the Fluval Flex? Well, with a sump, I can have an auto top-off system, and yeah, I can keep it topped off. And if I build a custom tank, I'll have correct lids so that I don't have to worry about jumps. Where even with this lid, the stupid SAEs in this thing have, in the past, jumped out of the feeding hole. Well, feeding slot. It's like It's, it's kind of a big slot, right? It's not really a hole. And, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's only been a little bit of a heart attack in the past. Uh, Cancer Trade, do a giant school of red rainbows, then add a stingray. It'd be really cool. I So, I, I like red rainbows, but I would much rather have Centoniensis, which is a red rainbow, because they're they're just a little cooler. you got, like, these dark black fins to them. Their reds shift a little bit, depending on how they're, how they're doing. Sometimes you get a little darkness in the body if they're not, like, uh, full on or whatever, but they display quite a lot. And they're a super tight schooler where, like, red rainbows, not so much. And you got a mixture of red color and not as uniform. You go from, like, super dark to kind of rusty. And very rarely you get that brilliant red color unless you're talking, like, the Millennium Red Rainbow. Whereas the Centoniensis has a, like, really obvious. And it's beautiful because the fins are almost black. They're so dark in color. And then the body's this beautiful red. So you get this nice pop that occurs. It's almost like putting a black border around their body, and it just really makes that fish pop when you watch them swimming around. I know shown in the past, but like my group, when my boys are doing their thing, ooh boy, ooh boy. Uh, okay, Jenny Partridge, I'm trying to I'm trying your low blue light suggestion now for reducing my algae. I've tried CO2 booster, low lights, H2O2, CO2, and lots of water changes, and nothing is helping with BBA and green spot algae. Well, keep in mind, you're always going to have some level of dust or spot algae. That stuff's kind of just impossible to have. But if you're getting excessive amounts, usually it means one of two things. Either you have way too much light or we're dealing with too much phosphates in the water. Uh, And Blackbeard especially really does well with blue light and phosphates. So if you're feeding too heavily, that can cause that. One of the first things I ever suggest when people are dealing with certain types of, of algae is cut your feeding in half. So if you feed once a day... Either feed half as much as you are, or feed every other day. And one thing to keep in mind is a majority of fish, there are some exceptions, but a majority of fish only need 1% of their body weight per day to have a healthy meal. 
so if we're feeding kind of heavy and we know it's more than one percent of their body weight if we cut that towards like they have a fast day then a feeding day then a fasting day then a feeding day that reduces the overall amount of stuff in the system and it can help for the longevity of our fish with certain species not necessarily all some species really need daily feeding and some species of fish really need to feed kind of heavily and require more maintenance on our behalf a lot of plecos are a good example here for them to really be super healthy they eat a ton they really do and they make a mess but most of us aren't keeping just like a ton of plecos or if we are we're already prepared for that kind of setup and we're, we're doing extra maintenance to help deal with algaes that they don't eat right usually that combination of like adjusting your lighting and reducing your food very typically stops or significantly slows the algae growth and can get you on the right path to having the plants kind of fight back if you will and handle the excess stuff that's in your system so that that algae is not taking control anymore and it's a slow process so i want to be very clear there but it's it's all about taking steady corrections and working toward getting your balance in line so that your system naturally fights off enough of the things that would help algae flourish and keeps algae at a minimum you're always going to have a minimum amount even like my most effective systems have small amounts of algae here and there that's just normal and that's why i keep some kind of algae maintenance crew fish in almost all my tanks because they help minimize how much i see that but you're always going to get a little bit on the glass it's just how it is and that's why you have stuff like your your algae scrapers or your mag floats or whatever that just up oh, once a week just zip it across the front glass side glass whatever glasses you want to make sure it looks clean easy peasy if you're doing it regularly it's pretty fast and it, it goes away easily now when we have excess of algae like if if in a week your your whole front glass looks like this corner here of my flex that i leave like that on purpose where it's just a, a bunch of stuff there <laughs> then yeah there's probably some balance issue you can do but in my case like i purposely let that happen because i've got a pleco in there and he feeds on that stuff and and that's fine right it's just excess food for that pleco and it doesn't bug me in the appearance that much because it's an area that gets <laughs> a little extra because the tanks mostly low maintenance plants and i run the light for 13 hours a day Just don't do that <laughs> don't do what i do necessarily unless your system's designed to handle it all right so we got back to the voting i'm starting to catch up starting to catch up oh i like a lot of the things that people have suggested it's like Paul, bob purcell mentioned the wild moosters totally i love that fish so much uh and you know i love a lot of the fish let's be very clear i love a lot of the fish but if i was forced to gun to my head i'd make some painful decisions <laughs> make some painful decisions let me see here. I want to make sure I didn't miss anything too crazy. I had a jump. So if I do miss your question, don't be afraid to, to repost it, right? I'm, I'm okay with that. Uh, Desert Fish Keeper mentioned go Bozeman Eye. They got you back into the hobby. Same reason I can't go too long without guppies. Well, Bozeman Eye didn't get me back in the hobby. Bozeman Eye got me into Rainbow Fish and then turned me into the psycho I am today. So maybe that's that's kind of accurate. Is like they got me like way neck deep in the hobby again. Um, it was an Aquas game tank that got me back in the hobby, but then I initially was going to keep mostly Tetras and Danios and small schoolers, and then I saw a tour of Gary Lang's fish room, and I went, eh, throw that right out the window. It's rainbow time. <laughs> and I've never looked back, except for my, 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 my guppy babies. Uh, JD Partridge again said, Bozeman Eye for me. If my tank was 480 gallons, I would have a bunch of them. I love the way they school and follow you around the room. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're begging for food they, they have endless bottomless pits for stomachs or at least that's what they want you to believe connor costello how to get good sword growth well uh first you need a lot of steel oh <laughs> that's a bad joke i know so most of our swords there are a few exceptions to this and they're usually the very red or like something like the uh purple knight sword where they have a very dark coloration most of our swords prefer low to medium light for a longer period in the day instead of a short period of light with very bright, intense light. So often we're told like, 
don't run your light for more than six to eight hours, maybe only even four hours, but that's going to be optimal for your plants. And this is usually true with stems. You want bright light for a short period, reduces algae, lets the plants grow, do their photosynthesis, do all those things. Swords are like the opposite. They come from environments where they have very long days because they're more toward the center of the equator. So the days are longer. They get lots of sun. But when you're underwater, lots of sun causes algae. However, swords are fairly low demand. They pull a lot in from their roots. So if you really want to be optimal, have a really good substrate. Usually an aqua soil is going to be your best bet. Yes, you can do dirt, but just keep the caveats of all the normal warnings for a dirt or tank. It really helps to have root tabs going into there pretty regularly. Sometimes this is like a root tab every two weeks. And as they get bigger, this might be three or four root tabs every couple weeks because they will chew through a lot of those nutrients as they get big. But you can have something like a lot less light, say 40 par, right? Not a lot, but that's like medium light for 10 or 12 hours a day. And that's going to be much better for that sword than 100 par for six hours. Because of the way that they grow these huge root systems, and they, they have these big broad leaves, they're great at absorbing less intense light over a longer period and just continuously consuming all those nutrients. That's what swords are amazing at. So, in general, the best way to get super healthy sword growth lengthen the amount of exposure that you have to your light i i usually suggest if you're doing a heavy sword oriented tank and lots of crypts and stuff like that go for 10 or 12 hours of light but bring that power that intensity down so if we're talking like a let's say you had a uh, 75 gallon tank okay and you're using the the flueball 3.0 i would put i would cap my like my whites and my pink at 65 percent I'd have my blue super low, like 5%. And then I'd run that light for probably an hour and a half sunrise, an hour and a half sunset, and nine hours of daylight in the middle. So you're getting 12 total hours of light, but it's much less intense with that height. And you're going to get a it's going to get diffracted and all that stuff, and that's perfectly fine. Good substrate, thick substrate too. I'm talking something like four inches plus because you want to have lots of room for a very big, healthy root system. Now, if you're doing dirt, you don't need to go that deep. You really only need like half an inch of dirt. And then you could have a reasonable sand cap or a gravel cap on top of that, something that makes it so that the, the sword can move its roots down in. You don't want to over choke that thing. And then from there, just make sure it's well fed and it'll do the rest for you. CO2 helps, but definitely not necessary. And if you do CO2, keep it very low. On that 75-gallon example, two bubbles a second. Low and slow. Let it just absorb all that stuff, take its time, do its thing. But just remember, the bigger that sword gets, the way larger the root system gets, and the more root tabs you're probably going to have to feed that thing to help keep it going. They will get very root tab hungry. They don't necessarily have to have root tabs. If you use like a ADA Amazonia, Brightwell, any of those you know, clay or ash style, like the little ball style aqua soils. You can use liquids, but really it helps to use some amount of root tabs because they're a very hungry plant. They eat a lot of nutrients and don't keep plecos with swords. Plecos will just eat swords all day long. So if you have plecos and swords, that's part of the reason why you're struggling with your sword growth. There you go. There's my, my, my small treatise on the sword plant. <laughs> oh, Jacob Hill. One tank only, huge geophagus redhead tank. Hey, man. Uh, you know, Dean kind of has that in a, like a 75-gallon at his place, and they look amazing. His, his geophagus are amazing. The color is just unreal on those things. I don't get enough algae in my tank. I would be scared to get autos. So uh, let me address that too. Autos are great because they'll feed on biofilm and not necessarily algae. Uh, and, and the way that basically you just like help that is you slightly overfeed or you get something like uh, Bacter AE, 
Bacter AE helps produce extra biofilm. I, I regularly use just a little touch of Bacter AE in, in some of my tanks that have more or larger colonies of, uh, of my autosynclos. But in general, like I keep small groups in heavily planted tanks. There's just always biofilm everywhere for them to slowly feed off of. And I have lots of fat and very happy autosynclos. You know, like three autosynclos in a 40 gallon tank is perfect. If you could do a bigger group, then I would start supplementing with something like Bacter AE. But in general, if you have a heavily planted tank, there's lot, there's going to be plenty of biofilm for them to feed on. They're just going to move all over the place. Your excess waste from your other fish, they'll get some little stuff here and there. They'll be just fine. <laughs> Paul Soltero, Bentley, one big tank equals more rads. And Stephen P, a thousand Gertrude A. <laughs> I don't 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 get me wrong. This would be wild, but that's the the little guys. I do like rads, and I'll have a rad tank at one point, but. If I'm going that big, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta play to a certain loves. Just gotta. Connor Heaven, one tank for me would equal a bunch of Hillstream Loach, a school of Longfin Rosy Barbs, and maybe some Variatus, perhaps a Dojo or two. Oh yeah, maybe I'd have to have a Danger Doodle in with my big tank, wouldn't I? I'd, I'd have to put Danger Doodle in there. My, my lady would probably kill me if I didn't. <laughs> oh man. Uh, of course, it's Sean, the, the Shelly superfan, the only correct answer is Shell Dwellers. <laughs> Could you imagine, like, a 240-gallon-plus Shell do Dweller tank? That would be wild. Especially if you got it shallow and just took a huge footprint instead of going what you normally do, where it's, like, two foot tall with a lot of those tanks. Although, if it's two foot tall, they'll, they'll do some stuff. They'll swim up and around. But could you imagine a Shell Dweller tank that big? That would be wild. Uh, let's see here. Leo209 would do a Rio Zingu tank with L134s, dither fish on top of a 125, and at least 18 L134, either Rummy Nose or Kobo. Not sure about Kobo. Uh, I'm sure that my brain is just blanking, but yeah. So, you're, well, 134, you're talking Leopard Frog Pleco. Pretty amazing fish. 18 of them at least. Whew. That's a bill. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a heck of a fish bill right there. But hey, it'd be fun. It would be fun. Northwest Aqua Hobby. I would have a 55 with a bunch of low-tech plants. I love simple. <laughs> hey, man, there's nothing wrong with that. Easy, easy is your friend. Oh, this is a great question. Atkins Nature Aquariums. I once saw some kind of blue-eye rainbow in a full saltwater reef tank. Can some species go full salt water? One can. That is Pseudomagill cyanodorsalis. So uh, pseudo the cyanodorsalis is this really cool fish. It's blue with a yellow streak on top, right? Uh, Gary Lang actually keeps this particular fish. They have to be at a minimum in a very, very um, salt-heavy brackish tank. So their salinization level to where they do best is almost full salt, and they will live in full salt. You can keep that rainbow in a reef tank, which is pretty wild, because normally we associate all the, the rainbows with fresh water, right? Except for that one, just the one, Cyanodorsalis. And they're, I mean, they're cool enough. I gotta, I gotta show you this picture, because... There we go. That's what I'm looking for. Let me find the good picture. Hold on. That's what I'm looking for. Come on. One sec. We're, we're doing this the, the slow way. I know, I know, I know. Oh, did I pick the wrong puller? I picked the wrong puller. That's not it. Where did, uh, where did I save this stupid thing to? Oh. <laughs> uh. Bentley, you dummy. There it is. Now let me get this to the right size. Because it's kind of huge. There we go. There we go. All right, check this bad boy out. 
I'm sorry. I got it in reverse in my head. Blue stripes up top, yellow on the body. Blue at the bottom with yellow is uh, a little different. That is a pseudomagill that can live full salt water. Now, they typically are found in uh, brackish situations, but more salt heavy than fresh heavy. So they're usually right there at the edge of the sea. That's where they're found down in Australia. But they can live full salt. Yeah. That is a saltwater capable rainbow fish. Pretty wild, man. Pretty wild. Oh, Sandy, Sandy's trying to do some crazy nonsense here. You're trying to break the rules hardcore, Sandy. I would do two 125, one on the top of the other, linked to one system. Top tank would be discus and quarries and neon tetris. Bottom tank would be half made into a sump. The other half, a lush planted garden with shrimp. Trying to protect the shrimp in a sump. I respect. I respect. Kind of cheating, kind of not. I like it. I like it. I like it. All right. Let me see here. Yeah, uh, you totally, like, a 40-gallon reef with cyanodorsalis is something you could totally do, Atkins. And it's sick. I've seen one picture of one like deep in the recesses of the rainbow fish nerddom. And I, I've never seen video of the tank. And all, all I did was this. Uh, they used, I think they were using some of the, the harder stuff, if I remember right. So uh, the, the more like stony coral type stuff. All right. MNC Aquatics. At Bentley, what rainbows would you recommend for a 40-gallon long? Good question. Um, in general, because you've got that distance, you can you can have some different rainbows, but you're not super tall and you're not super wide, right? You're still like kind of a 55-gallon uh, footprint, just not very tall. So I would personally look at smaller rainbows. So things like uh, the Running River is great. You could do the Cali Tawa if you wanna if you wanna spend some buccarinos. I mean, it's a it's a gorgeous fish. Do not get me wrong, and it's worth it. Uh, things like the Maculakai, you could do Parva. They're slightly big, but not too big. Uh, even the uh, Chalatharina Alenai, they don't get super huge, so they would fit, and they they love that swim space. Just make sure that. You're, you're shooting for fish that top out at about three and a half inches or so. That's that's a goal, but they can get a little bit bigger. Just don't get a very huge school. Do something like eight fish, nine fish, and and let make sure you have lids. <laughs> because you're not very tall in that tank, right? You have a risk of jumping, and you just don't want to. You don't want to have come in like overnight and have something random have spooked your fish and have something jumped out and lose one. So make sure you have lids. It's the same lids you put on a 55-gallon tank. It's just not quite as tall. And and basically, you have a lot of options. Don't go for the super big boys. Don't go for the guys that are going to get five and a half, five inches. Uh, try to stick smaller. You could do like the Aves Creek, right? the Bozeman Eye. They stay a little bit smaller for the most part. Although some people have had them get really big. So that's interesting. But for the most part, I've seen them stay at about that three and a half inch range. Um, what would I What would I specifically do in that tank? Centine Ansa is going to be really cool. Let's put that out there. Uh, I wouldn't do Blaheri because they're just going to get too big. Uh, they get they get big. They're very, very large boys. Uh, but I would I would say that's a lot of good options. You could also look at something like the Kamaka Rainbow or the Pygmy Rainbow. Uh, you could also Madagascar Rainbows if you want some slightly more common rainbows that are a little more easy to find in some of your stores. Uh, of course, the Praycox or the uh, Wapoga Red Laser being another the slightly rarer version of the Praycox you could look at. Those are all great smaller rainbows that are going to look immaculate in a tank like that. Especially if that tank gets a little bit of sun. <laughs> you plant growing rainbow fish keeping, Psycho. That's true. I am. Uh, gasoline going to be $7 by the end of the year. I don't know if it's going to be quite that high, but yeah, it's... Man, ga I'm... I feel very fortunate because as the 
the used car market is right now, there's no way I could have ever afforded the car I have. Uh, I bought mine at like literally the absolute perfect time to get my, my electric and I'm very blessed to have that thing right now because <laughs> my, my previous car, so my previous car, the 2005 Mustang GT, so it's a V8 in a stick and that thing would just chew through gas. I averaged 12 miles per gallon in that thing and most of that's because I drive in traffic a lot. So I would spend on average at current prices about 17 to $19 a day, depending on traffic, just in commuting back and forth to work. That's how much gas that thing chews through. Where in my electric, I spend $2 a day. Right now, because it's cold weather, I actually spend about two fifty. <laughs> but you just think about that right away, right? Think about the savings difference. Now, granted, my car payment is significantly higher because electrics are expensive, but the the savings when you're saving literally like $15 a day adds up very fast, right? I mean, you guys can do that math very simply. You just, you think of like, okay, four weeks, five days a week, that's 20 days, 20 times 15, that's a chunk of money, right? That's a chunk of money. And that's that doesn't even account for my weekend driving, which I, I can I can do stuff to where it's just mitigates so much of the cost of driving around. I think my uh, when I went down to Fishtoberfest, my total round trip cost was about thirty eight dollars. Going all the way down to Portland and back from uh, the from the Seattle area in my electric, which is like nothing. In my Mustang, that would have been the hundred and twenty probably. <laughs> but it was a very fun car oh it was fun <laughs> uh nur hello would you advise getting a cheap white red green blue light or a more expensive and stronger white only light so that depends really heavily on the plants and the tank let me explain if you are doing mostly low demand plants you don't need a super powerful expensive light however often those more expensive lights do make the colors of your fish look better so if you have a fish that shows a lot of color like rainbow fish or has more subtle colors then often those better lights kind of make that color pop right you see a lot more that you wouldn't see on a cheaper light However, if you're doing something like a 40-gallon breeder where it's not super tall and you're looking at, like, uh, one of the, the newer Hygers or that, like, the JCMP that I've done, those are all great lights for those kind of tanks. You don't necessarily need the most powerful light because often the most powerful, expensive light is too powerful unless you're dealing with lots of super fast-growing plants, you're doing a lot of maintenance, and you have high CO2. But if you're doing a little more like low maintenance tank, you got a lot of crypts, some java fern, some uh, some of the lotuses or dwarf aquarium lilies. Uh, maybe you're looking at nubiuses or you have easy stem plants like Ludwigias or like Pogostam and octopus. This stuff that doesn't like need a ton of light. You don't need the super powerful light. You can save a little money on your light. Now you can look at something like um, your Phoenix your uh entry level even like uh twin stars because they're not quite as expensive yeah they're a little more expensive than some of the more economically friendly options out there uh something like the fluval aqua sky not quite as powerful but still pretty serviceable light especially you guys have seen my review on it i did a crypt tank and my crypts went hog wild under that light um there's there's lots of options out there the big thing is look at your tank and let that tell you the story you need to know. If you're mostly low maintenance plants, or maybe you're not very heavily planted at all, maybe you just have like a lot of Anubias on some wood, but otherwise you're not using a lot of plants, get a less powerful light. Otherwise you're gonna deal with a ton of algae. Do you have a lot of super high demand plants? You're doing lots of Rotalas and fast growing stems and and you have a like really fine carpet, like you're using uh, Monte Carlo or Dwarf Babies here or something like that. Now you need that more powerful light. And yes, you're better off getting the more powerful white-only light at that point. Let your plants tell you what kind of light you need and the size of your tank. If you have a super tall tank, you probably need something more powerful. 
If you have a shallower tank, you probably don't need something super powerful. You just need it to give you enough light. Especially if you have very low maintenance plants. I always suggest with any light you look at, find something that has an ability to control the intensity of the light. That way you can make adjustments within that light if the even the initial setting is too high or too low. If you have an ability to go up a little bit or down a little bit, it'll save you a world of hurt versus going like, here's the best light out there. A UNS Titan or something like this. It, it comes at a million jillion powerful. It has par all of it. But it only has one setting. And then that setting ends up being way too much. But you can't dim it down. So what do you do from there? You just start like hanging the thing further and higher and higher and higher up. It's a spill light all over the place. Not worth it at that point. It's a waste of money. Where you could get economical lights, JCMP, the Hyger, etc. There's lots of them out there. I'm not saying only those two. Those are just two that come to mind of the more recently designed versions that have some level of control, put out reasonably good light, not terribly expensive. That's that's my suggestion there. LSB, is yellow or white light better to show off a shiny silver fish? Um, I would argue you're probably better off with white light because it's going to make the silver look more pure and silver. Uh, yellow is going to give it a slight tinge. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to look bad. And, and one thing that you could kind of test is looking at... Um, if, if you can, if you have some kind of adjustable light, you can get some of the smaller, like... Um, what is it? The, the Philips Hue or whatever that'll let you adjust them in a like a normal house light, and you can mess with those kind of things. Uh, find if you have like small lights that you can mess with the color temperature at all, and like shine more yellow light on that fish versus more white light, and see what looks better to your eye. Uh, and if you can find pictures online that show you that kind of stuff, that helps. But in general, I would say a more Daylight spectrum, so like 5,600 Kelvin, 5,000 Kelvin, all the way up to like 6,500 Kelvin is going to probably make that silver pop more than something that's a little more yellowish. But that's all, that's what my eyes perceive. Your eyes might perceive it differently. That's, that's the unfortunate part. We humans are complex, weird individuals. <laughs> Two coolies for schoolie. That's why I have a sponge in the feeding slot. You are smarter than me. Why do I feel dumb for never thinking of that? You're onto some. <laughs> Dang it. <laughs> I feel so silly for not even thinking about that. Oh, yay. Uh, Alyssa Bentley. At Bentley Pascal. I've been putting substrate in my tanks recently. I've also been testing my water regularly for a year. I'm noticing I no longer need to do daily water changes. It's just more surface. Yeah, I mean, the more surface area you can create, the more beneficial bacteria you can get, all that kind of stuff. It really helps uh, deal with a lot of things. Even, like, big hunks of wood are become grounds for your bacteria culture, right? So wood and rock... It, the more porous, the more helpful because it has more and more surface area. But substrate does, does a world of help for you. T. I have it yellowing in some dwarf hair grass, but other dwarf hair grass in the tank is thriving. I have no furts or fish, just CO2 and snails. Well, <laughs> so with CO2, we increase the plant's capability to photosynthesize. And what's probably happening is that whatever is near... I wonder, is your greener dwarf hair grass near the intake for your filtration basically is all the extra detritus being pulled toward that one area so it's there and available toward the roots of that part of the grass and your output is on the other side so it's pushing things away from it so that those things are actually getting starved of some of what the snails leave behind in general if you're using co2 i would probably use at least a light amount of fertilizer you don't have to have a ton but a little bit goes a long way It'll probably help balance out your issue there. Um, you could in, even potentially use something like root tabs, but it might be hard if you have a really thick carpet of dwarf hair grass to get the root tabs down into the, the substrate. 
and then that's where a liquid can take over and the substrate can suck some of that stuff up, make it available to the roots and help recover that dwarf hair grass. <laughs> Evan C. Aquatics was 70 here yesterday. High today of 29. Wow, what a swing. It was actually really cold. We had snow today, uh, which is weird because normally we don't have snow at the end of February in the Seattle area, but uh, that's what we had, and we might get more tonight. So, <laughs> yay. <laughs> All right, uh, getting close. I'm going to try and answer these last couple questions. I'm going to go slightly rapid fire. Oh, man, I'm way behind. Talking too much. Bentley just never shuts up. Uh, let's see here. Jeez, I was way behind. Uh, so, quick one. Uh, Brandon, would a sword also be like a crypt with extra iron? Uh, not necessarily. They don't usually need as much iron as crypts, but... It doesn't necessarily hurt them. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Let's see here. Son of a quack. My 20, like 17, feels cramped because my plant's all stems. And I have some staghorn and brown hair allergy. A bit scared to cut off the, the offset. No room for trims. Should I do it? Uh, I would do it in sections if that was the case. Or start using liquid, uh, liquid carbon and spot dosing it to help kill some of the algae off at first. So you have to do less heavy trimming. Uh, but the brown hair algae, you should be able to remove by hand. It's a lot easier. The staghorn is where it gets a little tough. Uh, you basically just have to kill that staghorn off and then get it removed from there. Speed round. Lisa's tanks. I just had Ick in my rainbow fish tank and I'm down to three yellow and two bozomani rainbows. The yellows are chasing the two bozomani terribly. How long should I wait before adding more? Adding more fish? Uh, I would make sure that you've gone through... A couple cycles of your medication to make sure that whatever ick is down in the substrate is getting killed off before it has a chance to go up into the the fish again and start that cycle over. I would certainly wait a couple of weeks. Uh, I mean, is are there is it Bozemani females being chased by yellow males? If so, that's not super bad. But um, yep, yeah, I mean if they're chasing a ton and the other fish aren't able to eat all that much, that could cause stress and make them susceptible to some kind of bacteria or or something like that. So there's some risk there. Um, yeah, I mean, the big thing I would look at is just how long have you gone without ick? If it's been a couple of weeks, you're probably fine. If it's only been a few days, you really need to wait a little bit longer. And I know that sucks because you feel like, hey, I need to put some extra rainbows in here and disperse that that aggression, chasing, etc., that, that bullying. But uh, we, we just want to be safe and make sure we don't have a a, a sneak attack of new ick, right? We don't want to deal with that. Uh, Alex Rowe, on the subject of lights, have you ever thought of making your own? Thought of, yes. Can afford to do so and the amount of requirement to do all the things other than just, if you're talking about making like my own soldering it all together for one DIY light? Um, no, because I'm terrible at soldering. But if you're talking about like working with a company to build a light, I, I have nowhere near the kind of money to pull that off. <laughs> That's you're talking like one hundred and fifty thousand dollars plus to like actually build something out, and that's yeah no, I, I'm I'm one guy, man. <laughs> YouTube YouTube pays like five bucks, <laughs> not that kind of money. <laughs> oh man, fishaholic. What kinds of plants are low demanding plants? Who feeds through water? Uh, whoa. Okay, the short list: swords. Crips, Nymphaea, uh, Java Fern, Anubius, Boos, and Aponagetan are all, generally speaking, low-demand plants. This also includes uh, some of the microswords, so like Helanthium tenellum is an example. Okay? That's a pygmy chainsword. Also fairly low-demand are a lot of your like Valisneria species. Epiphytes feed through the water column. Rosettes, so crypts, swords, aponagetans are a bulb, but kind of qualify as a rosette, and, and things like your um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Bentley, your brain. Oh, uh, Lagonandras, okay, because most of them get planted. Those all feed mostly through their roots, very limited through their water column. 
stems typically feed at the water column. So, epiphytes, water column, as far as all low demand stuff, moss, water column, rosettes, and bulb type plants, heavy root feeders. So, your nymphaeas, your ponogetans, your swords, your crypts, those are all going to feed down at the roots, mostly in your substrate. Your java ferns, your nubiuses, your booses, and your bulbitis, those are all epiphyte plants, water column. Whew. Whew. All right. Let me see if I can catch up. I'll take like one more question and then we'll kick it over to Dr. Black because he is coming up next. Uh, do you have a freshwater equivalent of an octopus to represent the Kraken? <laughs> uh, nope. I got nothing. I got nothing, man. I got nothing. I just got a hat. All right. One more question. One more question. Uh, Mark, what effects have you seen of high nitrates on rainbows? Uh, I, well, I haven't because I have like heavily planted tanks for almost all my rainbows and the, the tanks that don't have high plant loads get 50% water changes weekly. So I, I basically never get to that situation. Uh, I know that some rainbows can be susceptible to, to high nitrates. So in general, that's why a lot of us rainbow keepers tend to do heavily planted tanks. Not only does it make the, the color in the rainbows pop more. And the rainbows tend to be much more comfortable in a heavily planted tank. It also deals with a lot of nitrates, makes your system more stable, makes it makes the water better, and they really care about high water quality, helps add oxygen to your water, all those kind of things. All positives. There's lots of basically symbiotic goodness when it comes to plants and rainbows. Bam. All right. Uh, that's going to be it. Uh, Alex Burgos. Okay, one more. Alex Burgos, my Java Fern is not doing so well. Any tips? It really depends on what you're seeing in the in the Java Fern. If you're seeing lots of spots, like brown spots or holes, you need more potassium. That's the most common thing is that they're very, very uh, potassium hungry, unlike a lot of other plants. So very typically the most common problem you run into is not enough potassium for them in the system. If you're seeing something else, more widespread issue, shoot me an email, send me pictures of the plants. Don't get them too close up. Make it, make it easier to see... Uh, clearly as opposed to like zooming in as far as possible and it gets all pixelated bentley.pasco at gmail.com i'll put it in chat real fast shoot me an email i'll catch it up uh it'll still probably take me like four or five days at this point but i try to catch up to everybody and make sure that i'm, I'm good especially coming into this weekend shoot me an email i'll try and help you out with a little bit extra detail uh last thing i'm going to answer real fast because it's quick and then we will shoot it over to dr black Who's coming up next? Go have a drink with my good Aussie friend, Bentley. Any upcoming plans for Frimpy Business? Trying to start a Caradina tank this year. Uh, you know, I don't have anything specifically hammered out. I need to reach out to him now that we're we're far enough into things. So I, I originally we had a plan to go over to Shrimpy Business and uh, and check out all his stuff and, and do a tour. But out of an abundance of respect for his family, with with the pandemic going on, we just basically held held off on it. Um, and you know, it was his wife just really didn't want to have folks over unless it was family. And I, I wanted to respect that. I didn't want to put any pressure on her. And he was like, Oh, I'm pretty sure, you know, I can talk to her a little bit. And, and it just eventually it, it turned into a, you know, I, let's just play it safe, man. We got plenty of time. We'll get stuff figured out. You're doing great. He's been doing, he's been doing great. I just need to catch up with him. I've been working a, an absolute S ton <laughs> and, um, you know, things, things are finally kind of chilling a little bit to where I might be able to take time and take a day and go out and do some tours and stuff like that. So, um, it's, it's folks like Nick over Trimpy Business, uh, Will over at Pacific Northwest Aqua Hobby. You know, these are some people that I want to go out and visit, tour their places. There's a few other places that I, I want to tour that are local to me that are, are interesting that you guys are not on YouTube. You guys probably never even heard of, but, um, they do some really cool stuff. So there's some stuff I'm trying to get in the works most of that's probably going to wait until we get into some of the nicer weather and summer and when people have a little bit freer schedules. Uh, and hopefully hopefully my schedule gets free. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's it for right now. No official plans. Although, I'll check in with him and I'll put something up on the uh, the community tab. We'll see if we can get something nailed out. Because he has this just amazing fish. The shrimp room. Let's be accurate. Shrimp room. And I really want to go take a look. Because he's, he's a fantastic dude. Anyway. That being said, if I missed your question, please feel free to shoot me an email. I've caught up a lot. I'm not going to be like a month behind anymore. 
but uh, it still will be probably somewhere between four and five days right now is what I'm looking at for a response time. I'm hoping to get like everything taken care of in my email by this weekend, hopefully within the next two days, get back to you, help you out, uh, or just wait for next week and we'll get more questions in next week's show. As always, guys, thank you so much for watching and stay awesome.